Welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron, Ryan G. Brown! Today's episode is going to be presented by Tony. Tony, what are we learning about this week? We're going to be talking about the failure of the SS Bessemer. The Bessemer... Now, the... My connection with that name in my head is the guy who invented the steel refining process, which I'm yes, pretty sure was a good idea. Seems to be. Seems to be working out for us as a society that we have steel. It was a good enough process that he is Sir Henry Bessemer, and he had over 129 patents, so this guy was no slouch as an inventor. But as we've talked about before, there's a lot of times where very, very smart people make just kind of dumb mistakes, and it's a messy thing, inventing, and not everything's going to work quite right. All right. What was Bessemer's bad idea? Oh, Bessemer's bad idea was that he was tired of being seasick all the time. With less than 10% of the population being immune to the effects of motion sickness, you'd think that humans would have developed countermeasures for the chunky effects of being on the water. Sure, we have Dramamine, and history as a whole has a whole slew of weird ideas on how to handle seasickness, but what if we just kept the cabin from moving by keeping it on gimbals? This is what Sir Henry Bessemer thought, anyway, as he had to travel far and wide for his work on steel. The Bessemer method would be used for over a hundred years. It got replaced around 1950 with some more efficient methods, but it really did change the the game by being able to take low-quality pig iron and take the impurities out and turn it into full-on steel. This also dramatically lowered the cost of, uh, of steel and affected everything from weapons manufacturing to bridge building. We've talked about some bridge failures in the past. A lot of times they were using cast iron, and that is a big reason why they failed quicker. Like, this sort of steel made everything safer as far as uh, bridges and pretty much everything else goes. So, here's what I'm picking up so far. Bessemer is killing it with his steel method. He's developed this method of making steel, he's making a lot of money, and he's changing the world for the better... But, to do that, he has to go hither, thither, and yon, and the way to go hither, thither, and yon at the time was mostly on a boat. Yep. And, and he uh, hates it, it. A lot of it was just straight up, like, crossing the English Channel and then being on land from there. But he had to do that all the time, and he just got tired of it. And people who are inventors, like, necessity is the mother of invention, and all of a sudden, like, he's like, I've got a problem I could solve here. And then he built a bridge, right? With that good, yep. good steel. Just that giant bridge across the English Channel. I mean, they did build a tunnel. It's not the most ridiculous thing. No, so he built a ship, obviously. You've already said that. I'm not. I'm being facetious, naturally. Tell us about this ship, Tony. So it's going to stay level while the sea moves. Yes, and the reason why he thought of this is he was looking at a compass on a ship. And whenever you look at a compass, it's on these gimbals and allows the uh, the needle to not be moving with uh, the water and everything else. It's like it's on a fixed point. Whereas the, the entire ship is moving left and right and pitching up and down, like the compass is just staying almost perfectly level. There's like a tiny bit of wobble to it, but not even that much. And so he thought if you were able to do that with a room, you would be able to keep the nausea from coming. This is a time when people who had seasickness, they thought it was because their organs were shifting around, not that there was any sort of problem with their uh, their inner ear or anything like that. And so most of what was being done was straight up like girdles. Like, people thought that girdles would help cure motion sickness, and Bessemer thought that it was more about the actual motion itself, and that this idea would end up being able to solve that. Okay. Well, you would definitely, I I mean, that was probably people's reference point. If you were a sailor, sailor, you were probably frequently experiencing this. Well, I don't know if people get used to it or not. I mean, Bessemer obviously didn't. Yeah, some people just aren't going to be able to do it, and some people can get more used to it. Like... And also people develop better ways of doing it, like uh, locking their eyes on the horizon for a little bit, and there's a lot of different uh, small things. Also, ginseng works really well for it. It's like one of the few like homeopathic-type things that actually works. Cool. Also, in my notes, I found out that there were people thinking that you could electroshock your organs into staying still. <laughs> so, this is not the worst idea we've had as far as trying to help with motion sickness. Oh, the gimbals. I thought you were going to talk yeah. about the, uh, that one does sound like it's pretty far up there. Yeah, yeah I, I, like, that doesn't I, even make sense, right? No, like, it doesn't. The, the girdle, I could see, right? You think, well, my guts are moving around, and you think that because your guts feel real, real bad. 
So you strap yeah. on this girdle and it squishes everything into place and maybe that holds everything in. At least there's a certain logic there. It doesn't make sense to go from my guts are moving around to what if I hit these bad boys with some electricity, eh? Yeah, and I could not find all that much uh, on that particular invention. I don't think it was uh, very long-lived, and I don't think any, it was from a major inventor who's very popular. It was just something I was reading about, the different ways they tried it. Eh, people Otherwise, were very much definitely... into hitting stuff with electricity at the time, though. There was a lot of electric cures. But this is where the Bessemer Saloon comes in. He got tired of creating his own shark chum off the side of the boat every time he crossed the channel, and decided it was time to dig up part of his garden and make a prototype. With the idea of that compass in mind, he wondered if he applied this to an entire room, if it would end up working. In his garden, he ended up making this room on Gibbles, and I actually found like a, a woodcut drawing of this. It's something where it's it looks like a small house where it's just moving up and down like on the sides, but the, the part where he's standing in the very center of it is perfectly stable. And it actually looks pretty cool. I can't tell if there's a, like a like cog mechanisms below where you turn it and it like turns the ship or if he actually did it with a pool which sounds a little bit cheaper and easier but it actually did work it was probably about 15 by 15 and it looked it just looked like it, he was onto something so like, what went wrong it, uh basically physics ah <sighs> physics <laughs> yes. our old nemesis we're gonna, we're gonna get into like the actual physics of what happens with this once it's at sea but this inspired Bessemer to go all out. Instead of making a small prototype ship to do this, he built a 70-foot long and 30-foot wide room, put them on gimbals, and installed this on a 350-foot long ship he called the SS Bessemer. So he buys a ship and then builds the room inside of it? Like it's already... No, he, he built the room and commissioned a shipbuilder to build around it. Oh, so he's, he's from the ground up. Yeah. He's literally saying, I, no, like, I'm I'm not just installing, like, a cool little room that I can maybe hang out in for a few minutes. I'm building my own ship, and it will be the only seasickness-proof ship in the world. Yeah, like, uh, he got Sir Edward Reed, who's a railroad magnate and a naval architect, to build this ship at his shipyards. Like, uh, they were known for making a lot of different experimental crafts at that particular place. And also, Bessemer didn't even have to pay for this entirely out of his own pocket. He was able to raise $250,000 uh, from various investors. And if I did a little bit of math on that, that's about 29 million pounds or $37 million. Because this that's, was 1869. That's a large amount of money. Although not, I mean, if you're building an entire ship to go across yeah, like the how English much does Channel... A, yeah, how much does like a ferry for the English Channel cost now? Or like how much does a cruise ship cost? Like... I'm sure I don't know if they still do ferries your... since they have the channel or not. No, that's just for the train, right? I guess you can't drive cars down there. I'm not sure how that works, honestly. I'm gonna shut I, up. I'm not sure either. I know that uh, I know that I've seen in movies where it's like people are loading their cars to go across the channel, but like that was '80s movies, so who knows? This is, uh, if we've got any British people in the audience who want to leave a comment on this video over on YouTube, please let us know how people get their cars across the English Channel easier. It's a big catapult, Tony. Yeah. But it's only the, the on the landings, English side. The landing's a little bit sketchy. Yeah. And whenever they, they, they try to catapult over from France, they just use longbows to stop the cars. But the Bessemer itself was a paddle steamer that was 350 feet long. Imagine a football field with both end zones added for near reference. It was not the tallest ship in the world. It was basically uh, two or three decks. Still a nice-looking boat, but it kind of gives me that vibe of, like, the Huck Finn, like, era, like, I uh, steamboats on the river like that sort of a ship with the giant paddle wheels I would imagine and at this point it's probably relatively novel though like by the time Huck Finn is around what, what time frame are we in at this point this is uh, 1869 to 1875 never mind it's right there with Huck Finn done. yeah shut in my mouth <laughs> And this saloon, which I'm not entirely sure what the definition of a saloon is. I always think Western Bar, but, uh, like, apparently there's more to it than that. This was not just a huge room, but it was it was decked out in full Victorian style. Beautiful hardwoods all over, houseplants, expensive rugs, Moroccan leather chairs, hand-painted tableaus, and so on. It was really a gorgeous piece of hardware. Man, physics, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I it just like I'm hearing all this stuff and it sounds great. You're gonna stop stupid seasickness. You've got this beautiful and you get to boat. Do it in style. I, 
I gotta say, like, in my mind's eye, I'm sort of imagining the vibe of the Titanic, right? Like, it kind of gives that, that vibe. Big, but, right, that sort of lavish uh, ornamentation and everything. The inside of that particular saloon definitely looked like the, the pictures I've seen of the Titanic and the recreations from movies and such. I don't know how accurate those are, but it seemed pretty swanky. For the larger ship, the room was controlled through these gimbals and a hydraulic system operated by a man watching a spirit level. Which is not a Ghostbusters apparatus, it's just pretty much a normal bubble level. <laughs> From the sounds of it, one of the ship's employees would have to deal with the possibility of seasickness while constantly adjusting the saloon itself. So, like, you've just got this guy that's kind of on the outside watching the level and he's using a wheel to uh, move these hydraulic systems. So, it's, it's probably not the best job. You're probably, like, below deck and it's just kind of a cramped thing while you're just knowing all these rich people are drinking expensive brandy and everything next to you. But, it's a job. That was almost every job at the time, though. I mean, yeah, really. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I didn't know this detail, so I'm going to pull back the curtain just a tad and say that I have heard of the thing you're talking about here, Tony. I was not previously aware, though, that there was actually a dude who was trying to adjust this rocking back and forth thing manually. As the yeah. spirit level moved, he's trying to, to fix it. I thought it was maybe gravity operated, but the fact I thought that so too until I actually read this. Like I, I'd heard about the Bessemer before, and I'd heard a little bit. I did not know that it was a manually operated machine. That's so wild because in my mind, when I heard about this, I thought, well, maybe a computer could do something similar today, and maybe it could, right? Maybe their fa reaction time and other things would make this work out a little bit better than it did for Bessemer with the guy watching a level, but... Well, there are some pretty incredible, like, gyroscopic stabilizers for boats now. Like, even small boats can have them. They take a lot of power, and they're very, very expensive, but it's basically a, cent a centrifuge or a gyroscopic thing running at about 10,000 RPM that makes it so that your boat barely moves on the water. Okay, but that's different than what I was thinking of. So... Yeah. I'm just interested in the fact that this guy is in here with the... Like, it is actually an intelligent system driven by... Uh, at least, it is arguably an intelligent system driven by a person trying to compensate for the sea. Yeah. And from what I was reading, a little bit of it, of it is gravity-based. It's more like uh, he's controlling the hydraulics to make sure that whenever they hit certain types of water, it's kind of adjusting to it. Okay. It's not 100%. It's a little bit of both. In September 1874, the newly titled SS Bessemer took to the English Channel. The private crews seemed to be working very well. People weren't getting sick as easily, and they got to do it in style in the saloon. Like, uh, they were able to dramatically dampen what was going on in the channel at the time. But that's where the problem hits. When you put something on gimbals, it isn't as affected by the slowing of the rest of the ship. When the captain tried to slow down, the giant heavy room was still swinging. This made for many issues with inertia to which the captain was unable to fully control. Instead of its first voyage going peaceful across the channel, it ran hard into the pier of Calais. Thankfully, no one was hurt. The pier took the brunt of the damage and was eventually able to slow down the ship. But your $39 million ship did just run into a big dock and probably got damaged, I would imagine. Yeah, there's definitely some damage that was, uh, that was put into this, and... Bessemer decided that he wasn't quite ready to scrap this yet, so he took the ship to a shipyard, it was repaired, and this time he decided to have it be a public voyage where he just let anybody on it instead of just his friends. So, this was a little bit of a high-risk situation, and people could tell that the wheels weren't entirely repaired yet, like there were just some problems and they rushed the repairs. They also, on their second one, decided to lock the uh, to lock the gimbal so it wouldn't even be like a good room to be in anymore. There was still a little bit of movement on that. It was enough that they still had some trouble with steering because it wasn't fully locked down. It was just moderately locked down. But it definitely brought problems with the structural integrity and just added a wobble to a ship that was already having trouble over normal waters. So let me see if I understand here. They had this room that could sort of move around within the hull of the ship. The moving around of the room caused the ship not to be able to slow down as quickly as the captain was expecting. So to fix this problem, they've now locked it down, which mitigates the helpfulness of the whole system to begin with, but they're hoping we'll at least get them back to England 
safely without knocking down any more docks. Well, they got it back to England before. This is going back to Calais. Oh, okay. This is kind of an interesting insight into humans at this point, because crowds had gathered at Calais because they heard the ship that broke their pier was coming back, <laughs> and humanity's always been drawn to a train wreck. In front of a giant live audience, the ship pitched and rolled. The new veteran captain did his best, but he ended up slamming into the pier, taking out all of its supports and completely destabilizing it. The second accident was actually worse than the first. Did anybody die in this one? Because I'm imagining no. all of these people now lined up like, eh, what do you got for us? And then, like, actually getting hit again? No, like, I, nobody died in this one. Like, this is, a, this is a surprising bad idea that doesn't lead to any deaths, despite being an out-of-control ship. Hooray! Maybe it's just because it was a nice, small, or, a, like, kind of lower-to-the-sea ship. It wasn't something that was, like, eight stories high or anything like that. Like, you have to watch Speed 2 for that. Bessemer had the ship taken back to England where it would sit in port for a few years before it would be dismantled. The previously mentioned shipbuilder, Edward James Reed, thought it would be a waste to lose such an elegant cabin, so he had it taken out and placed on his property as one of the coolest billiard rooms I've ever heard of. That does sound pretty boss. I was not able to find out how they did this, because I'm wondering, like, they had to have just disassembled it, because I can't imagine trying to move a 30-foot wide, 70-foot long cabin. Like, in those times... That would We're be talking hard about now. a shipbuilder, though, Tony. This guy That's true. does have some resources, and I, I would imagine probably doesn't have his house miles and miles from the place he works. No, and it's probably a big wide-open property, too, considering it ended up being turned into a college later. When Edward Reed's home was eventually turned into a college, this building was turned into the Women's Agricultural College of Swansea. And it was that for many, many years. Unfortunately, it met its end during World War II, during the bombings of Britain. I'm not sure why they did a direct hit on a college, but hey, that's what they were aiming at. Well, it might have been. We know for a fact that a lot of those high-altitude bombers were just sort of aiming kind of in the vicinity of things, and if it was near a shipping port, probably would have been some valuable assets around the area. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like spray-and-pray to style bombing. Fortunately, that was the only thing the Germans ever did wrong. While the problems with seasickness are still a thing, we have a fair amount of drug options that work well, as well as the understanding about why it happens and how to help it. The idea of using gibbles to stabilize things has taken hold, but not so much for entire cabins. If you've ever seen a pool table on a cruise ship, usually they are using really cool gimbal systems, and there's there's a lot of videos of this, this online where during really rough seas, people are trying to play pool, where they're moving up and down and the table is staying completely still. A lot of yachts and other things also have beds that do the same thing, so like your just your bed is completely stable. So some good came out of this. It wasn't a yeah. It was a good idea, badly implemented. Yeah, and I, I still wonder if you were able to have like an electronic system that managed all of this and accounted for sway and all that. If you could actually have this on a larger boat now, but they they've done so much for cruise ships to make them a little bit more stable that. I'm not sure it's needed as much as before. Like, you've been on a cruise ship. I never have. Like, did you get any sort of seasickness? I didn't, but my wife did. Yeah. She was very much Even on a ship that size and having their little retractable rudders and everything, it's not quite enough to keep everyone from getting seasick, but it's a lot better than it was. Well, I think people also underestimate how much the sea can move. I mean, we were on relatively calm waters, and yet you're still dealing with you know, you're just not used to a room moving. You're inside of a room and you think, well, this should be not moving. And then <laughs> even like, you know, a few inches of change in the elevation of the floor one way or the other has your brain going, what, 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 wait a minute, what is this? Like, seasickness is basically just sensory confusion anyway, which is always funny that the result is like, well, throw up. And the it's really wild. I'm sure you saw some of these videos as well to see huge storms and cruise ships trying to go through those with deck chairs just slide to one side, slide to the other side. I mean, seas, even for something as big as a full-size cruise ship like we have today, can really have waves big enough to seriously affect the ship, so... Yeah, or whenever you see a shipping container like that hits a part of water and 15, th 20, 30 shipping uh, of the containers just go flying into the water. It's like, that's it's scary. 
The worst I've been on was I went to Jamaica and we were facing like 15 foot swells all day. So you're just like going up and then going down and going up and going down. And I ended up throwing up while everybody else was watching a whale. <laughs> so that was Jamaica. But the bad idea here is basically not building a to scale test. Like he made the little one in his yard, but he didn't do something with an actual ship. I think if he would have made like a something that was maybe like 30, 40 feet long as a test, he would have figured out that the uh, that you weren't able to steer it with current technology that well. So that's probably the bad idea, but this is kind of a light-hearted one that I just thought was pretty interesting that didn't pan out. I think there's maybe also a possibility that because it was so different from other kinds of ships that maybe with experience somebody could have figured out how to get it safely into harbor, but thinking, oh, we'll just go out in the water and it'll be fine, and the captain not being used to a ship with a room that moves around inside of it probably was not able to compensate as well as he should have. Yeah, and at this time it was actually a very, very fierce competition time uh, for this sort of... for getting people across the English Channel. So uh, their reputation was really damaged as well, whenever it's like you're 0 for 2 whenever you're trying to cross without hitting a pier... And everybody else just knows how to do it easier and cost less. So it was, it was also like kind of economic factors that forced them to not keep trying. So you're saying there's an element of we're kind of in a race here as well? Uh, not so much a, a race. It was just that there were a lot of companies that were already doing that and people weren't concerned enough with paying the extra to like have that comfort for a room where they don't get seasick. Like oh, there was okay. just a lot of other options, and like they were less expensive and less likely to run into a pier. That is our story of the SS Bessemer. So if you enjoyed this, please check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash badideas. Throw us a comment on this video. If you really enjoyed it, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash human echoes. I want to point out, Tony did not edit the words bad ideas in there, despite the fact that it sounded a lot like he did. <laughs> I almost said human echoes, but we have three <laughs> channels, we and have sometimes more like as well. yeah. yes. Also, if you like uh, video content or if you like movie content, YouTube.com/slash human echoes or game content, YouTube.com/slash human echoes gaming. If we're just going to be showing all our stuff, but the most important one is Patreon.com/slash human echoes, where you can help support yes. us. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.